awesome. Variants and you. <laughs> um, so, what is what is variance? So, I guess the 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 simplest way is, <laughs> at least in terms of how you see it in your code, variances is, is the plus and minus. Uh, so if you've worked with like Zio and you like have actually looked at the signature of Zio, it has this like minus R plus E plus A. Um, or if you look at um, like a type like say a uh, Q, Q -E -U -E, if I can spell that right, this is like super and Scott like six type parameters. It's got like the EAs and the EBs. And then it's got like a minus A and a plus B. And so the question you, you might have is kind of what's, what, what's the deal with all these pluses and minuses and kind of why do we need them? What are they saying? And then the other thing that you might kind of wonder about with this is if you've like looked at something like Zio um, and you've looked at a signature of a method like flat map, which we probably like we use a bunch, but you've probably seen there's this like R1, this like less than R and E1 greater than E and B. And this is like R1, E1B. And then this is R1, E1, D. And so one question would be, what's the deal with these plus and minuses? Second question could be, what's the deal with these like other like R1s and E1s? And like, why do we need them? And like, why is it like, what, what is this less than thing that has a colon and this greater than thing that has a colon? And why do we need them? Um, so like goal today would be for you all to have a um, better understanding of that and hopefully understanding that's not just like kind of a technical one, but like a intuitive one of like when you look at this, like this can actually tell you something pretty helpful about this data type and like how it fits together with other data types. Yeah, I'm glad you started with this. It's, that's an awesome goal to be able to not to have this not be frightening because I know <laughs> when I first saw this kind of code, it was it looked deeply complicated. You can't even tell where like these things start and end. This just looks like a cluster of <laughs> nonsense. But eventually, you know, you, you recognize patterns. There are only a couple of shapes, and they generally, if you know, there are only a few different variations of this. So you can you can pattern match out the meaning pretty quickly. Though at first, it is incredibly overwhelming. So hopefully, we can take you over that hump. Yeah. Um, so before we do variance, I'm just gonna like spend a, do a really quick review of um, just types in Scala in general, because variance is kind of how these, uh, these what we call parameterized types, types that have a hole in them, like a list of A, basically it has this hole for an A. And so variance is talking about how the type of the list relates to the type of this A. So we need to at least have a basic understanding of like how the types of the A's work before we can understand how the types of these parameterized types work. Um, and so, oops, I feel like I'm gonna run off by, uh, it's like auto follow maybe. Um, okay, um, so in Scala's type system, you can think of it as kind of a hierarchy. So at the top, you have this type called any, and that's everything's a part of that, but because everything's a part of it, it has no information. Like you can think of each of these types as saying like, what are you allowed to do with this, with this thing, right? Like if you have an integer, like you're allowed to like add it and multiply it. If you have a string, you're allowed to like get the first three characters of it. Um, and so any type has some like capabilities of like, these are like the methods you could call on it. And a, a type you can think of as like a set of all things that like expose a certain capability or set of capabilities. And so this any that's at the top of the hierarchy is something that everything's a part of it, but because everything's a part of it and anything might not implement any one interface, 
it doesn't have any actual functionality you can call on it. Um, and then at the bottom, uh, there's this type called nothing, which is the opposite of that of like, nothing is a part of this. Like there is no actual value of this, but because of that, it, at least theoretically, like if there was, it could have any structure in the world, which is why like nothing can actually be an example of this. And then in between, we've got all these like actual types of like, we've got an animal and then below that, we've got like a cat and we've got like a dog. Um, and maybe we have like some particular like a tabby cat, so like a subtype of a cat or something. Um, so it's this hierarchy here. <laughs> right, well, and then the idea is you've got this distinction between these types, which are kind of these sets of things and then the like individual values that were within that. So like worm is like a particular like instantiation of that like type of cats that is mostly wonderful, except when interrupting our symposiums. <laughs> so what these uh, pluses and minuses are really about is how the variance of the uh, parameterized type relates to the type that it's parameterized on. So like if we think about a list and we've got like a list, you know, I'll actually just give ourselves an actual trace here. So we've got like uh, an animal, a cat, and then we could say we've got a, um, let's just do, So we've got a list of animals and then we've got a list of cats. And so variance is really about answering the question of how are these two types related to each other? So for the animal and the cat, we know how they're related to each other because we've got this extends keyword here. So extends is the way in Scala we say that a cat is a subtype of an animal. And we can uh, kind of prove that to ourselves in Scala by doing this implicitly thing. So if I do implicitly cat's a subtype of animal, that's gonna compile. And if I do implicitly animal and subtype cat. I get this error saying like, there's no implicit argument of this, which is basically yes. saying that's not the case. Um, and yes, these, it says, it says no implicit is found for parameter E animal is less than cat. <laughs> right. Or subtype. Cat, yeah. yeah. And, and this less than, I mean, I guess it's just kind of a shorthand of, you, know, you don't want to like, I guess have to write out is subtype every time or something. But all this is, is a shorthand for saying this is a subtype of this. Um, mm -hmm. So whenever you see these kind of, with the col colon kind of, I guess means like at the type level. So when you see like this, like less than at the type level, it means this is a subtype of this. And so if we look at these with two me. and the compilation errors, we're saying the compiler is telling us, yep, cat's a subtype of animal. Nope, animal is not a subtype of cat. So I'm just going to make my own list here for a second. So the question then is, I know that, how do these two things relate to each other? How does a list of animals relate to a list of cats? And by default, if I don't do anything when I define a type like this, if I don't have any plus or minus, then this defaults to what's called invariant in Scala. And so what this means is if a type's invariant, then the fact that the types it's parameterized on are related has no impact on these two types being related. So like if I try to take my same stuff here and I say, oh, this is, uh, Mm 
Yeah, so these these all have the squigglies. Both have squigglies. Yeah, you're like, I think your compilation is like slightly ahead of my, there we go. <laughs> yeah, so these both have squigglies. And so that's saying neither of these are subtypes or of, an, of the other. So they're just totally unrelated types. They're like maybe one's a cat and one's a dog, right? A cat's not a subtype of a dog and a dog's not a subtype of a cat. They're just two like different types of things. Yeah, so we can see the only thing that compiles here just to sort of show, explain what's happening is, is this, this statement that's saying that cat, prove to me that yeah. cat is a subtype of animal. And it can do that. It can, it can manifest one of these implicit things <laughs> uh, as long as it is true that cat is indeed a subtype of animal. So none of these are true. Bad, bad, bad. Um, exactly. Uh, and another another way to potentially to do it, I, I don't know, I find this to be nice as well instead of just the, the implicit stuff because in, in Scala, basically, if you have, let me make an example object here and have a, ver a value called, let me just make a animal, mm -hmm. uh, which will be a new animal, and then a cat, which will be a new cat. Um, and so this is the type of cat, this is the type of animal. Uh, we can always assign uh, a, a value to uh, its uh, a type of its super type. Like we can we can we can pass in a more specific type, uh, at least at the top level here. Like it will automatically widen cat to animal for us. So we can also do this, and this is fine because cat is a subtype of animal, and therefore it will widen it. So when you when you do this kind of value assignments, you can widen here. You may have seen this if you have like a you know um, a seek. Right, a seek of int or something. You can pass in a list of ints here, and it will widen it to its super type being a seek event. Um, whereas you cannot go the other way and and specify that an animal is a cat, right? Because that is a subtype. So this will this will complain. It's a type mismatch. So if if this implicit holds, you can assign a value on the left hand side to uh, a variable that is typed as the 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 type on the right hand side, and that's called that's called widening. I believe uh, are generally referred to as. I'm not sure actually if it's called that in this situation, in this value assignment, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the same general concept where yeah, yeah, definitely. This, the subtype is 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 widened to its super type. So when you move from uh, subtype uh, to super type, that is that is known as widening. And then narrowing is the other direction. Uh, however, that just does not work um, here, uh, at least in this case. Okay, cool. I just want to show off another another way of potentially looking at this instead of just the implicit. So you can you can think. Yeah, uh, definitely. If you assign the thing on the right hand side to a wider type, then it's a sub a subtype. The right hand side has to always be a subtype of the left hand side. So an older pattern in Scala is to is to do is to keep things invariant like this, and that ends up actually causing a lot of problems because we're when we do that, the compiler doesn't know the things that we know are true in the world. Um, so if I think about like having a list of cats, and I mean, let's say that a cat um, has its own way of meowing. You know, every, everyone has their own way of purring. Um, so if I have a um, and let's actually let's actually do it maybe here. Let's uh, say all these cats have names. So if I've got a list of cats, I should be able to treat them as a list of animals. And so we could imagine also like let's say I have a dog that extends animal. And so what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to say, if I've got like a dog list, it's a list of dogs, and I've got a cat list. Thanks. <laughs> That's a list of cats. And then Let's say my list type has some um, like concat operator, right? That says, okay, I can take it with another list and I get back a new list. So what I'd like to be able to do then 
is a yeah exactly and so what we should know is that these two together okay we lost the information of whether it's cats or dogs because now we got both of them but we know they're both animals and if they all have names we should be able to like print out the names of all these things but if we look at this we're actually getting this like compilation error it says it required a list of dogs and you just gave it a list of cats so we can't do something that like makes sense in like the actual domain and then we kind of picked a just like simple silly little domain of like animals here um, because what we're doing with the with our types isn't uh, reflecting what we know is true in the world that like if we got a cat and a dog like they're both animals so if we've got a list of cats a list of dogs then we've also got a list of animals and so variance is basically how we tell the Scala type system that. So like if I wanted to make this work here, I would change this to be a plus. And so plus means that this is either it contains or it somehow produces whatever that type is that it's parameterized on. So for like a list, like, yeah, that makes sense. The, the list actually contains a bunch of animals. And the kind of guarantee we have to have when we use the plus is that that type's only going to appear as an output and not as an input. And so that's where these like second set of symbols and these like greater than or less thans come in because the compiler is not going to let us do this plus plus thing because okay. right now show something? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. Just, just real quick, just to make a sort of a slightly more incremental step, just to show yeah, yeah. that, um, like, if we take the, the dog list and the animal list, just as previously down here, let me copy yeah. this example. We were able to, like, say, take a particular dog or cat, dog or cat, and assign each of these and uh, to, you know, animal zero. I'll say is dog, and this can be an animal, right? That works mm -hmm. because of that. that and always assign a subtype to its super type. It'll it'll automatically widen at the call site here. Oops, um, where'd it go? There it is. So this is totally fine. And if we did not, and now we're so yeah, we're basically doing the same thing on single types here. But now in these containerized, <laughs> that's not the word for this, but these so these, these types that are in these type constructors, right? Um, uh, like lists and, and options and things like that. If we did not have the little plus down here that that made it covariant. Then we're going to run into that same problem, which was causing our implicit to fail, which is that, yeah, the same, the thing that we can do here at the individual um, single value level does not lift, uh, does not, it does not lift once these types are inside of containers like lists. Uh, but ideally, like it's the same concept, right? You have a dog, you have a cat, these can be animals. If you have a list and a dog and a list of cats, like intuitively, we know that these are listed animals. Um, so this doesn't work, but all we have to do with this case is to add a plus and now this compiles because it tells it tells the compiler yes that the the variance the uh <laughs> the 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 subtyping relationships of the container vary in the same direction as the subtyping relationships of their values that they contain of whatever value that parameter is so uh it, the subtyping relationship goes dog is a subtype of animal cat is a subtype of animal therefore now, by putting that plus there, you're saying, well, then a list of dog is also a subtype of a list of animal, and a list of cat is also a subtype of a list of animal. So it's it's kind of you know it's kind of basic and it's nice. And uh, but then there's the additional problem. Then you try to write methods on it that Adam was just getting into, and then you get this problem like, oh shoot, I thought we solved all our problems. Not quite. And this is why there's some more verbosity. But we're gonna break that down too. But I wanted to separate those two pieces. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's perfect. Um, so yeah, so whenever we use this plus uh, we're not allowed to put that type in. We're only allowed to get it out. And the reason of, for that is that in some cases, if we were able to put a value in, we would be able to create unsoundness in Scala's type system. Uh, we'd basically be able to do something where we'd make a bunch of moves that would each be like valid moves according to like the rules of Scala, but we would get something that would cause a runtime error. And the whole point of having a type system is that we can't do that. And so the Scala compiler is gonna like stop us from like 
setting that bomb for ourselves at the beginning by just saying, if it's covariant like this, if it's got the plus, you're never allowed to put an A in, you're only allowed to get an A out. And so the way we get around this, because we definitely still want to be able to combine these different lists, is this is where this like type is a super type comes in. And so what we do is we define a new type and a, a common convention is we'll call this like just the same type, but just with like a one after it. And then we're gonna use this greater than colon. So that says this is a super type. And so let's actually maybe make this even more explicit here. Let's maybe call this like element. And then we could call this like element one. And so what we're saying is if we have a list of like cats, we can add it to, with something else that's a list of something that's more general than a cat. So if we've got a list of cats, we can add a list of animals to it. And if we do that, this isn't strictly required by the type system, but practically this is almost always required. What that means is that we're gonna get a list of that more general thing back. So like now this like, we can think about this a little more intuitively as saying, if we've got a list of cats and we add a list of animals, we're gonna get back a list of animals. And that actually like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly, we can be like super. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and, and to show off sort of like what's happening, like um, in, what, 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 another way that this would have worked, like if I make animal list uh, can cats, Right, I could I could have also taken animalist um, one and added it to animalist two. But actually, before I even here, let me I'll, I'll redo this in just a minute. Um, here, I'll copy this. Like, like if we just did this, notice how. Uh, oh well, that's 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 totally sad, isn't it? Because it's covariant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Ah uh, yes, because it's covariant. Well, the funny thing is that this you can this this does this type checks right because they're both animalist at this point. This allows it to widen, um, which actually uh, like that that would still be happy. But obviously yes, because because of the fact that it's covariant, it just does not allow you to use a type A in this position. So never never mind uh, quite that. I was going to try to show off a more incremental example, but it does not allow it to uh, to to work. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah. So to maybe move to like a little bit more of like a real world example, like another thing we could make that would be covariant is let's imagine we had something like a um, event source. And so we just said this is going to be a, this is going to be a source of events. So something that produces or contains something inside it, that's going to be covariant. And so let's imagine that this has some method we can call on it to get the next event. And maybe this is going to be just to like keep things simple. Let's say this is going to be like an option of an event. And so the protocol is going to be, we can call this. And if we get some, then we're going to have an event. And if we get none, then this event source is done producing events. And we at least should not call it again after that. So, I mean, this is a little bit of just like kind of a souped up like iterator, um, but we can see how that's something that would be covariant here. And so we could like, um, try implementing one of these uh, methods here um, to like combine these different iter iterators. So like we could say S plus, let's synchronize on event one, and then this will have another iterator. I guess we'll call this event source. And so this has a very similar signature to 
the one for combining lists that we saw above. Yeah, it's basically like if you just want to, if it's confusing to you, and this is actually kind of how I think I started doing it before I completely yeah. understood variants, uh -huh. I just understood the basically the pattern, which is, yeah, if if your if your type contains or produces that type, you could put a plus on it, and that'll make it more inferable. It'll make it compose nicer. But if you then write these combinator functions that are going to combine two of these containers or producers. Then you simply do, uh, yeah. This a is a a one is a super type of a, and then basically just always refer to a one from there on out. So you're going to first get the error. Like you can be sort of, if you want to be very stupid about it, which is a great way to start, to sort of reflexive about it. You write some, you're writing some combinator. You want to take that. You want to take a second event source of type event. You can even write this out at first, and then uh -huh. you're going to get an error saying, oh wait covariant position. Oh, yeah, I know what to do when I see this silly error. If it says covariant, then I have to make a new type. That's a super type and use that. And then just replace all events from that point on with event one. And you can be pretty mechanical about it. I, I hope we can under help you understand what that actually means. Now that you understand that uh, these these represent, um, this means you read this as the thing on the left hand side is a super type of the thing on the right hand side. So animal has to be a super type of cat. Um, yeah, yeah. Someone, someone asked a question actually a while ago, uh, and I wanted to touch oh, on yeah. that, which is how should, how should we read these two operators, right? How should we read, um, uh, this and this syntax? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I call this one like super type and this one subtype or is, is super type of is subtype of. So like, if I wanted to read this and kind of be in plain English, I think I would say this is A1 is a super type of A. Yeah. Oh, let me follow you. Where? Oh, there you are. Yes. Yeah, so A1 is a super type of A. And and and, and I think what I was trying to do was, was just make it slightly more mechanical. I think the uh, if we had an, an invariant list, in in list, uh -huh. just A, and we wanted to do something like like this, where we didn't have the types. What we could do is, and I think you've seen this, you see this in certain libraries that don't have yeah. variants, which is you have this this widen method, which is going to uh, allow uh, you to basically just do this part. So it's kind of nice because it breaks out these. You're kind of doing two things at once here. You're both widening, like doing this sort of implicit widening. You're letting the compiler do some widening for you and doing the combination. Whereas if you do it the invariant way, like you have to separate these steps out in two parts, um, which is saying that basically, if you give this a super type of A, then you can get back a list of that super type. And basically all you would do, I think in this case, isn't it sort of like this dot as instance of, it's kind of a cast, right? Yeah, um, typically. In this of A1. Um, yeah, but basically at this point, oops, in list, you basically have to know that it's safe to do this. Because uh, there are some situations, and they're kind of maybe a little difficult to just intuit automatically. Maybe we could try to contrive one where there's a reason why the compiler tracks that, and, and it gave us that warning saying you're using the covariance in, in the invariant or the in the contravariant position and all that stuff. Uh, you can you can get into weird bugs that are really hard to track, but the compiler takes care of that for you uh, if you use variance. If you do it manually like this, you just have to make sure that you're not widening something inappropriately. Uh, but yeah, so the, the sort of the manual way of doing this would be. If you had uh, I animal list in list one and in list two, uh, so these obviously are not happy. But then you could sort of do dots. Oops, these would have to be I dog list in list. As you can see, it's kind of painful. Uh, we could say dot widen animal, or really, I think I could just say widen, and it'll, it might be able to figure it out contextually. Let's see. Are you happy? Yeah, so it was able to figure that out contextually because I've, I've said it there, but I could also say, okay, please widen it to an animal. Um, yeah, oops, I've done something horrible. And then at this point, we can make our sort of I combined animal list by concatenating I animal list one and I animal list two because at this point, they're the same type. Or we could have inlined this and said I dog list and I cat list, but then we would have had to sort of widen each side. So kind of painful and and not great. So wouldn't it be nice if, if the compiler could do that automatically for us? And if you look at like the type signature of widen here, 
and, and what happens when you add a, the, contra, the covariant uh, plus here is that it's able to sort of auto widen. We were already able to see that um, for animalist one, it's able to do the auto widening as long as it knows the type. Um, so by doing this syntax, we're basically saying, okay, if the right hand side is a super type, and it will automatically figure that out, right? We're actually passing in cat. Like we're, we're up here, we were joining um, uh, dogs, a list of dogs to a list of cats, right? Uh, or if I do dog list plus plus cat list, now that this will work. Um, we're not actually giving it a list of animals here. We're not giving it a super type. We're giving it actually a totally different type, a cat. But the compiler is able to figure out and resolve. It's doing all the work for you to say that, well, technically while it's a list of cats, they both are part of the same type hierarchy. So I'm able to actually infer this as a list of, I can just sort of find the least upper bound. Uh, Phil, you actually asked this question as well. Um, uh, asking, you know, which is confusing. Like, yeah, is the compiler doing this? Is it finding the least upper bound for you? Are you specifying the least upper bound? What's happening here? The compiler is figuring out that there is a type that is a super type of both cat list and dog list, the least upper bound. Basically saying cat list is that type and then it's going to uh, yeah, widen everything to that type. So even though we're passing in not even a super type here, it's able to do that automatically for you. So a few steps are happening. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I'm not sure if that helps. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's always because of that covariance of it's always a valid move for the compiler to widen one of these types if it knows it's covariant. And so even mm -hmm. if it's got like the cat and the dog, it's gonna try to find a way to make this code compile. And so it's gonna say, well, oh, uh, right now these are just two different types, that doesn't work, but I can widen the dog to being an animal and then it does work. So that's kind of, again, you're like getting the compiler to work for you when you're using variants. Which is awesome because it's not fun to sort of have to manually, when you get some complicated nested types and it says, you know, there's a giant type error, it's hard to read and- Yeah, really, well, you know, can be really especially, dangerous. I mean, yeah, in these cases, it's one thing, but when you have like the like closely of either T and then something's not working, like you just like, you want to just like, I don't know, do something bad. <laughs> um, so I think the other thing that's really helpful when you think about both the, these, these covariant types is what those, uh, those top and bottom types mean. So the uh, any, and nothing. So for any covariant type, that nothing type essentially means it's never going to produce those values. So like if we look at this event source interface here, it's got these two things you can do. You can call, you can check whether it's got another event and you can get an event from it. And we said we can never produce a value of type nothing. So what that means is if we have an event source of nothing, then this method can never succeed. So in this case, that means it's just gonna have to throw an exception, but that means that that's an event source that's like never going to produce an event. And so I mean, essentially we can instantiate that by saying like the like empty event source. It's just never going to have another value. And in this case, we're kind of doing an imperative interface. So anytime you try to call something on it, it's just going to throw some kind of exception. So that's nothing. The other type of value any here means that it's going to produce some value, but that value isn't going to have any useful information. So another way, like a lot of times we'll use, um, especially uh, historically, we'll use unit for this. So unit's another way of saying that like, this thing isn't going to return any useful value. It's just going to do something for its effect. So if we write something like, um, print line that has unit here and all this is actually gonna do is like print line 
this. That unit type, this is strange. Okay. Huh. That unit type there is saying this isn't returning any useful value back to us. Um, this is just being done for its effects here. And really, whenever you see unit like this, you can actually either think about it or you can actually replace it with any here. Because any has that same meaning of unit of like, it's going to do something, but it's not going to return any value that you can do something with. Um, so whenever you see that, that means something's being done purely for its side effects. So for example, if we're in like Zio and you look at like the signature of like the finalizer in like Z managed or like in bracket, it's got the signature A to Zio are nothing any. And so this anything is saying this finalizer is not going to return any value that you can do something with. It's just going to be executed for its effect of like closing whatever this resource is. Yeah, it's sort of another way to think about the super type to subtype hierarchy is that uh, you know, you as you as you as you move down the type hierarchy, as you move from any down to you know animal, down to cat, you're you're basically adding structure. You're adding more and more information. So that yeah. means that if you go all the way to the left or all the way to the top of the hierarchy, you basically can assume that you know no structure. Obviously, it's Java. You can do type casting. You can do you can always call hash or two string on anything. But thinking a little purely modulo that uh, complexity. It's basically uh, the, the yeah. It's it's the type that you um, in a pure world, in the ideal world, any is is this structureless, useless thing um, that you shouldn't poke around with, unless you're doing some like optimized internal hacky stuff. <laughs> um, so so th these are all covariant types, and I think those are ones that probably are a little bit more intuitive to people because. There are a lot of them that we probably work with on a pretty regular basis. And like even if we think about like in the Scala library, anything in the collections hierarchy is generally going to be one of these and is generally going to be covariant. So like if you look at list in the Scala standard library or vector, those things are covariant. And so I think that kind of makes sense to people of like, okay, it's like some container of things, or you can generalize a little bit to maybe not a container, but a producer of things. And that we want to have this property that like, it works the same way that like, if we've got the animals being a super type of the cats, then we want the list of animals to be a super type of the list of cats. Um, I just want to throw up one thing real quick, actually, because yeah. just to tie in with the, the another use of, of nothing that you've probably seen before is right, if yeah. you have a list, you have this and you have the tail, you have the head, of some A, and you have a tail of another list of A, list of A, my list of A, extends my list of A, groups A. But then you'll also see this case object, you know, empty uh, or nil or whatever, uh, making up my own names here. Uh, and this would extend that my list of, of nothing, uh, which might be confusing at first. Uh, but now that we know about covariants, we know that this makes perfect sense because you're, first of all, an empty list is basically a list of nothing. You're never going to get any values out of this, so it's kind of more accurate. But also, it's going to compose very nicely. It would be really annoying if you had to sort of widen an empty list or something in a in like a in a in a fold write or something. Um, but now, because we know that nothing is a subtype of everything, because why not? I mean, you're never going to be able to get it, so who cares? You know, you can you can make any lie, right? It's it's the it's the girlfriend that lives up in Canada that no one's ever going to meet. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's the type nothing. You can say anything you want about, uh, about your girlfriend in Canada. Um, uh, you know, she's 10 feet tall and she has uh, golden hair. Uh, but no one's ever going to meet her because she's not real. So uh, that's kind of what nothing is. It's, it's at the bottom of the type hierarchy. And and uh, sorry, I don't know where that metaphor came from. But um, uh, yeah, and so so it's it, you get to compose it very nicely with anything else uh, and it'll just automatically widen to any other type A and it's safe to do so because well you're never going to have to actually resolve the inconsistency there because there are zero values you cannot instantiate a type of nothing it's this empty set if we talk about types as, as values of, of, of sort of sets of different sizes different numbers 
Um, okay, I just wanted to, to touch on that to sort yeah, of yeah. another. Yeah, 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 that's super helpful. Um, so the other side of this is contravariance, uh, which I think is a little bit less intuitive to people, but if you think of covariant as things that have or produce values, things that are contravariant are things that consume values. Uh, so probably the one you're most used to in like the Scala standard library, uh, easy to think about it this way, is the input type to a function. Um, so like if I've got, uh, let's say, um, So this is a really simple example of something that consumes values in some way. And in this case, it's at least based on the name, it seems like it's gonna consume them by printing them somewhere. Um, but we could have all sorts of different things that consume values and do different things with them. Um, so we could have something like a predicate. Um, I'll just like evaluate that's going to give us some kind of Boolean value of, right, this says give me a value and I'll tell you if something is true or false about it. Um, so any of these things are consumers of values versus producers of them. And the interesting thing about them is that those subtyping relationships we looked at before work the opposite way than they did with the covariant types. Um, so like if we just play with this like printer example for a minute, um, so let's create a couple of these printers. So like one of these printers could be, um, I want to keep the same animation. And in this case, we're going to try and try to get around the fact that, like, when we normally print arrays, we get this like useful thing, useless thing that's just like their little reference. So here we'll do like print line um, a dot make string. Um, so this is something that, in this case, it consumes values of type of rays and it does something with them. In this case, it prints out this like nice string representation of them. Um, so this is a printer of arrays. And then we could have something else like say we have default printer. Um, and that's a printer of any. And this is just going to call print line on this thing. It's not going to do any special logic on it. So the question we've got here, similar to the question we had with the lists of the animals and cats above, is how are these two things related to each other? Are these completely unrelated, or do they have some connection to each other? And I think just like above, we can kind of do the like assignment thing or we can do the implicit thing to kind of get the compiler to like help us out with this a little bit. Um, but let's just try kind of seeing what the compiler says about this. So let's say is a printer of any a subtype of a printer of variance. 
and there's a printer ants subtype for any. And so what the compiler is telling us is that's okay. This is bad. And so let's like think for a minute about like what that means. Because I think this can be a little bit less intuitive. And I think the I think the best way to think about it is in terms of capabilities. So something that's contravariant like this, it has the capability to do something. And so if we think about like this like default printer, it's got the capability to take any value that you give it and print it. So like in the world of printers, like it's a really powerful printer. It's like in a way like the most powerful printer but it says like, look, I got, I got all the bases covered, right? You give me an array, you give me a string, you give me an int, you give me your own case class. I got it all covered. Like I'm like the man here. Um, versus if you look at this array printer, it's like a little bit more limited. It's like, well, you know, if you, if you give me an array, I can take care of that. But you give me an int, you give me a string, give me a case class, that, that's not my problem. I don't know what to do with that. And so just like when we talked about like the cats and the dogs, like, and the animals, like being a cat means you have like more structure and more capabilities than an animal, right? Like, I don't know, maybe you meow versus the animal just has a name or whatever. Um, so similarly here, the like printer of any has more capabilities than the printer of the array of ints because it can print anything versus just being able to like print arrays. Um, and so you can notice here that this relationship is the opposite of the relationship for these parameterized types. So if I do it on the, yeah, exactly, we can do implicitly any is a subtype of array events. And then we can do implicitly array of events. subtype of any, this is okay. That's false. So the contra and contravariant is we flip this around. So here was array events is a subtype of any, which makes sense. We said any was at the top, array has got more structure, more information about it. But when we've got a contravariant type, the printer of any ends up being the more specific type than the printer of arrays, because the printer of any has more power and more structure that knows how to print anything versus just knowing how to print arrays. So yeah, it's it's yeah, it's like an inverse relationship. It, it co-varies, meaning it varies with the, the underlying type versus contra-varies, it, it varies against the underlying type. So the type relationships are are inverted. Um, it might also be useful just to quickly show off just the, again, this with the dog animal one for this as well, um, where it is, yes, dog is a subtype of animal, but that means now that a printer of animal is actually a subtype of a printer of dog and not the other way around any longer. So unlike with the list, uh, dog animal. So that, that doesn't work. List, it works because um, this is covariant versus contravariant. It just flips. Covariant goes the same way as, yeah, the underlying types. We just lift it into the thing. But once it's in the contravariant structure, it's inverted. Uh, yep. And so just like with the covariant types, with the contravariant types, that like any and nothing has particular meanings. Um, so the any, like we saw with this default printer here, means you can accept any input in the world. Um, and the exact kind of implication of that may depend a little bit on what this type is, um, but that means it doesn't require any further type and whatever it's gonna do is gonna have to be very general because it doesn't have any information on those types and you could feed it anything. So like in this printer here, like the only reason we can even really implement this printer of any is because we're like kind of cheating from a like, functional programming perspective of we're like calling this print line method that's just gonna 
print out something for anything, even though it may or may not be a meaningful thing. Like we could call print on a function and we're just gonna get some, you know, kind of it's like location and memory. We're not gonna actually get any like useful string representation here. So something that has like a type of any is gonna to have to, is not gonna be able to really do anything with that any because it doesn't have any structure there. Or like if we go back to the Zio example, um, if we've got a Zio REA, if that R is any, then that means that we can provide it with any value you want to. So like when we actually go with a runtime to run it, we're just gonna provide it with like a unit value. So it can't be doing anything with that. So it's gotta already have all of the environment that it requires. So like in the context of Zio, R of any means like you don't have any more environment that you require. You've been provided with all the services that you're using. Uh, nothing also has a pretty like useful meaning here. And so to think about that, like think about um, what the nothing printer would look like here. <laughs> yeah. Quite useless. <laughs> Well, quite useless, but it, it, in fact, uh, even more than useless. So like you could never even call this. So like, let's say I've created this nothing printer here. And let's say that now I've got, uh, and now I try to take nothing printer. Oh, I guess I got to do printer dot nothing printer dot print name and it's going to give me an error here it says required nothing found string and like i try to do it with a string but i could i could try to do that with whatever number i with whatever thing i want i could try to do it with like an integer here and now i'll just i'll get a different error it'll say <laughs> required nothing found int but I'm still not even able to call this. Like this code won't even compile. Um, and in fact, there's, there's no value that I could provide to this that would actually allow this to run. And so you might say like, well, why is this like useful? Like, okay, you, you wrote a method that we can never call. Like what's the, what's the point of this? But what it lets us do in some cases is say that some methods of a, like a larger interface can't be called. So like now let's kind of build up from this now that we've got some of these intuitions and let's look at this thing called ZQ here. Oh, can we take one? Because we got one quick. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, please. Yeah, what do we got? Uh, so so just someone pointed out um, that uh, Array isn't isn't array uh, invariant, or shouldn't they be invariant because they're mutable? And they are invariant, yes. uh, actually. No, yes, they, no they are. They're, no. they're one of the ones that are invariant. In fact, all the mutable collections have to be invariant. Most of them we don't use, but exactly. array is the one that we still use because it's very helpful for performance sensitive code. But yeah, notice how we weren't saying like, oops, array of dog uh, was less than like array of animal or something, because that's invariant. That won't that won't make sense. We were saying an array event is less than any, and so it's not a matter of the variance of the array at this point. It's it's treating this as sort of a single type, and an array of anything is a subtype of any still. Uh, it's but it's not like an array of any. Like this wouldn't work, right? Because the array is invariant itself, but array itself is still a subtype of any, and potentially some other types as well, some like collection stuff. Maybe it's not. Uh, yes, it's it's a subtype of serializable and, and Java <laughs> lang clonable. So yeah, java.lang.clonable. Um, it's just not going to um, yeah, have that variance uh, information. So yeah, nothing nothing in here is going to, to, to make sense. But any works. So yeah, that's, a, that's an important, good, good question. Good. Yeah, yeah, really good question. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at the interface of this uh, ZQ thing now. 
So uh, you, you probably, if you, if you use a Zio, you may have used Zio's Q data type, which is a, a very cool data type. And when you did, you probably just worked with it as kind of a simple like Q of A, but it's actually a subtype of this fancier thing called a ZQ. <laughs> and it's kind of a testament to the power of variance that like this thing is like out in the world. If you're like using a Q, you use this like all the time and you have no idea probably that there are all these other like type variables here and like they haven't made things any harder for you. Um, and in fact, the same thing is true for a bunch of other things like ref that you like, if you use Zio, you've almost certainly used. So this thing, oops, oh, somehow lost the ZQ. Uh -huh. I can try to undo, oh, well. Works out. <laughs> And actually, I'm going to make it slightly, I'm going to challenge us a sec here. Uh, maybe I'll just do a couple of these. So this Q is defined in terms of really two fundamental operations. So one is this offer operation, where we're going to essentially like push a value to the Q. And this is going to give us a ZO effect, RA, EA, and then it'll give us this Boolean that tells us whether we offered it to the queue. And then it's going to give us this take operator. It's going to try to take one value. And this is going to be RB, EB, and B. So this is going to take a B value from the queue and it may require this environment RB and fail in error Q. So question for us now, what should be the variance on A here? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I admittedly probably did give it away earlier, but nevertheless. <laughs> So yeah, generally, I guess the way to think about it is that if a value is used as an input, right? So the contravariant types are used as, as input or, or consumers of those types. So clearly we're exactly. accepting here as input, um, we're consuming A's, so that would be contravariant. Uh -huh. And then as far as B goes, that's on the, it's sort of on the right-hand side and we're, we're producing these, these A's. So that would be a, uh, uh, oops, consumer and then producer or container. We can think of ourselves as a container of sorts, uh, even if it's not like we don't have the value all the time. Um, a, uh, oh, sorry, a B then. Yeah, yep. yeah that, that's exactly right. And we can reason about the error environment types exactly the same way that both of these you can think of as producers of errors. Uh, obviously, hopefully they won't produce errors at all and things will just work, but to the extent anything's happening with errors, errors are getting produced by one of these things, right? Errors are getting not literally thrown, so we don't throw exceptions, but failures are getting generated in one of these two methods, potentially. We're not doing anything to like handle errors in this. We're just maybe producing errors if these things fail. This is interesting though, because it's probably is worth pointing out because before, right, when we had our list, let me see if I can steal that little bit of code uh, from above. If when we had our, very simple list. Where'd it go? I could, I could do it again. Here it is. Our simple list. Um, I'll plop this right in. Oh, that's not. <laughs> um, so this thing, right? We, we also actually here accepted an A, right? Or we tried to accept an A there, but it, it, it yelled at us. But one could, one might imagine, like if you, if you just took the same approach that, oh, well, we are a, uh, it looks like, like the logic that I just used, oh, it looks like we're accepting this parameter, therefore we must be a consumer of A's and therefore this has to be contravariant. We might've said, oh, we're accepting, like the, in the initial version before we fixed it up to work with variance, we'd say, well, oh, we're accepting an A and therefore we must be a consumer of A's and therefore we should be contravariant, right? And, uh, and oops. Um, and when, when now it's sad here because it's being used as a return type, I think as well. Uh, right. Or is it? I, I'm actually not even sure. Um, contravariant type A occurs in a covariant position 
of a list of it. Actually, maybe that just breaks anyway because it's like doubly nested there. Um, but I think you actually do have to think about the semantics. You can't just always look at where, where it's being called. You have to actually think about the semantics of your data type. Like a list, even though we are calling A in here, it's more that this is a, this, you have to think that this version of, of this plus plus is actually more of a combinator, which we're using to build up another container. So it's not so much that this, this is a, a core uh, unary method on our type that is actually going to, in, intended to process these types. It's actually building up another larger container out of both types. So you actually have to think about, um, I think that the consumer producer analogy that um, Adam uses all the time is, is probably a better uh, understanding than just like literally looking where the argument is. Because yes, this, what, if this were like uh, a plus plus where we're building up a larger queue, then this actually doesn't necessarily entail that this is, should be a contravariant parameter. Um, but in this case, we're just accepting an A. We're not using it to build up some larger ZQ that is compo composed of both. So, yeah. Right. You got I mean, always Yeah, I think the other thing there is there's a little bit of distinction between mutable and immutable structures. Because like the list, we're saying we're going to produce a new list that has the elements of both of them and it's going to have this wider type. Whereas like this like ZQ thing is essentially a, a mutable Q within the context of ZO. So like once we create it, we can't change its type. It's a little more like the array of like, we can put things into and out of it, but it's going to like have the same type. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, this kind of makes sense. So then we might say, um, I'm interested in describing two new data types. Uh, so one I would like to describe is a, what we'll call an NQ. And, uh, And so this is a queue that can only be written to. Um, or you might think about this as like the um, supplier side view of a queue. Because someone's going to need to be able to read from the queue or at least read where those values are written to, because otherwise there's no point to this. But this would be a view of the queue where you only get to offer values you don't get to take. So we'd like to describe that type. And then we'd also like to describe this DQ type. And that you can think of as a queue that can only be taken from, or this would be like the consumer side view of the queue. Mm -hmm. And so if you like hadn't thought about this stuff before and you were just coming into this, you might say like, Okay, got it. We like need some new data types. You know, we need some kind of trait NQ. And then I guess this is the one we're just gonna offer to. So it's gonna have some like A. And then at least if we kind of follow this like polymorphic world here, it's gonna be this. And then I guess this is gonna need to be like parameterized on these guys. So be like. And so, okay, like that kind of works, but like, that's also like a little bit annoying here of like, we've had to have all these new data types and presumably like this is gonna have, oops, lots of other methods. And then this is also gonna need to have lots of other methods. And then we're also gonna have some issue of, we're gonna have lots of, other operators that deal with these things. And so we can imagine like if we have something that's like the Z stream, or have something to like construct it from a queue, well now do we also need like to construct it from one of these other things? Like it kind of seems like we're getting this like proliferation of things here. Um, but so this is where using these type parameters can be really valuable because we end up actually being able to define these just as type aliases for this thing. So let's like try to like work that through. So simplest thing for me is always start by putting the question marks. 
which I think by default, you can't actually use the question marks for types, but I feel like this like type question, question, question equals nothing is like pretty useful. So I think it's kind of a good one for exercises like this. Um, and so let's let's go back. Of, we've kind of got a little head start here of like, okay, we know what we want this and this offer to look like. So we know that we're going to want to take an RA here. So we'll do that. Here, let me just uh, actually copy the um, the signature down. I think from. Uh, should, I, should I delete these these trait stubs because we're going to use the type alias method instead? Uh, can you just comment them out because they'll actually be kind of helpful to us to, as we like look at these. Okay, sure, sure, sure. And I'll, I'll copy down the um, yeah, yeah, perfect. It's the definition, so we have this right yeah, below. Yeah, sorry, your screen's probably bigger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we said, wait, where'd our uh... oh at the, at the bottom? Oh no, yeah, yeah, for, for me, sorry. Um, so we've got our RA. Then if we look back up at the NQ definition we had here, we've got this EA, which is also this EA and this ZQ dummy. So we're going to need that guy. So we will do that. So we'll add plus EA. So we'll do that third one there. And then we know that we're going to accept an A value. And we still want to be able to do that. So we'll put an A here. So now we've kind of done the easy part. We've done like the ones that are just the same. So now the question is, what do we do with these other ones? And so what we kind of want here, if we like go to this, yeah, let's maybe call this just like dummy NQ or NQ dummy, I guess would be consistent. Let, let me pull this down too, so we can just have them yeah, all. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my text is yeah, really yeah, big. Yeah, so. sorry. <laughs> I, should, I should make yeah. mine as big as. <laughs> so no, no, it's all, it's all we know that if this NQ dummy really is ZQ, then it's gonna have some take method. but we don't want this to ever be called. So how do we make sure that no one ever calls it here? Well, so we said before that for Zio, this environment type is the type that we need to run this effect. And we said if it was any, then we had everything it needed and we can run it. And if it was nothing, then we could never run it because we could never provide it with what it needs to run. So if we want this uh, NQ dummy to be something we can never run, then we can make the environment type nothing new. So that would be RV then, okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then in a way, the other, uh, this, is, this is one of those problems where like the answer is kind of overdetermined because at this point, if we can never run it, then it kind of we can put whatever values we want here because <laughs> we're never going to be able to produce those values. Um, what do you do up, in here? It ends up being useful to have those be any and any um, because since we're never going to be able to produce it, we can uh, kind of make up any number, any value we want, and that way, if we have any specific queue, we can always treat it as one of these. And so now we've got this NQ thing. And so now like we don't have, we literally don't have to implement anything else except for this type alias. And if we've got any operators that work with queues, they'll be able to work with these as long as they have the appropriate type constraints, as long as they only need to write values, they don't need to read the values. Um, and we can do the exact same thing on the other side with uh, the DQ. And it kind of ends up being like the dual of this. <laughs> yeah, and then we can even, we, since, since there's kind of no, um, so there's not like an RB, we can just like get rid of the 
space here. I'm like slightly you just, simplifying this. You just flip them. So that becomes any, this becomes E, and then this becomes A, right? Oh, but I have my other non-dummy DQ up above, so I'll get rid of that other DQ. DQ, where'd you go? Oh, down here. Yeah, and I think the only one that's slightly off is uh, here when we uh, DQ, we, we don't want to be able to offer at all. So that one becomes nothing. Because we mm. can't offer at all here, right? We want this to oh. be nothing. So we could never call the offer. Okay. And then I guess it doesn't, should this, would it be any sort of like, it doesn't really matter what that is. You can never call it. Uh, that, that one ends up being the same because these ones have the same variance. It's just these last two that like the variance of these two is flipped. Okay. So this yeah. is, yeah. Oh, otherwise you're, yeah. 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 Otherwise you're hundred percent on. Um, and so uh, that, yeah. then we kind of immediately get these two types and we get like the guarantees we want that on the DQ, we can never try to offer a value. Like we can never even make it compile trying to offer value. Um, and on the NQ, we can never take a value. We can never even create a runnable program in Zio that would try to take the value. So we can never create that environment. And we've like expressed all of this just with these type aliases. We haven't had to like create any like subtypes or super types or worry about like, you know, are we gonna forget the information about the specific subtype it is or is some method gonna accept the right subtypes or super types? It all just like, kind of naturally happens because we're giving the compiler the information that it needs by using variance. And, and if like, I mean, thinking that sort of naive approach, if you just did sort of minus R, you should probably use variance minus E, well, or plus E, right? You couldn't, you, this would have to be invariant because you want to both, like if you, if you needed to offer these, have these both, met, both these methods, R, E, and uh, Boolean, and R, E, a right like yeah we 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 if we try to put plus here it's going to complain here because we're accepting this input if we try to make it contravariant it's going to yell at us here so we're kind of in this in this bind where we kind of have to keep it invariant or yeah you 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 put a z on the front <laughs> and yeah. duplicate all your parameters and then you get both views for free and i mean it's definitely a lot of it takes it takes a little bit getting used to i'm sure but um i think it's something that you can master pretty easily once you start doing it. Yeah, well, and going back to what we said earlier, a so we said something that was covariant was a producer of values. So like the Q is a producer of values in the sense that you can take values from it and get it. Uh, a value that's contravariant is a consumer of values. So like a Q is a consumer of values in the sense that you can offer values to the Q and it's gonna do something with them. In that case, kind of just like add it to this like data structure that it maintains internally. And whenever you combine something that is both a consumer and a producer, you end up at, at invariant. Invariant is kind of the lowest common denominator of like if you put things together that do both of them. And whenever you see something where you're both producing and consuming, it's worth asking whether those can actually be broken out into separate things. And the, sometimes the answer is no. Like, you know, array is an example of arrays and variants because you can write to the array and you can take from the array and just this very like low level thing of like, it just is what it is. It's just, like basically block of memory on the computer. So like, it just is what it is. Um, but if you've got something that's higher level, it's worth thinking, can you split those two things out? Because if you can, you're usually gonna expose a lot more operators and it's usually very easy to recover the like more monomorphic version here. So like, with this Q thing, um, I think we maybe use like, yeah, so like this actually becomes Q is just uh, A is just a ZQ that doesn't require an environment, that can't fail, and that has the same types for offering and taking. And with this variance here, like you, you're, you're never gonna know that like, you have this thing instead of this thing if you're just working with a queue. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I've, I've, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but ref is this very similar and, and perhaps you've used ref uh, if you use ZO and it's a similar thing. I'm not sure if it has, it probably has similar. Uh, it, it, yeah, the, 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 the Z ref does or the, the Z ref app that has the environment. 
Um, they're both sex hunters. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, oh yeah, so let's 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 pull it in and see. Okay, okay, only four. It's just the. Just it, a if, if you function. scroll down to the ZREF M, that's the one that has the environment. Oh, so. ZREF M, ZREF M, of course. Yep. Okay. Let me see ZREF M. There we go. ZREF M. Aha! There's our beautiful saxophoner. Perfect. Um, <laughs> Okay, cool. And now you kind of can kind of get it. Uh, and and also, if we look, let's look at some methods here. Let's see if we can. So math um, takes a, a B to C, right? B was the output type of this, right? Because we basically split we split what was the value that this ref contains into both sort of the input view and the output view, the contravariant view, and the like when you set this ref versus when you get a value from this ref into these two type parameters A and B. So you can map that output to a different type to a C. And then you get back, you know, the R, A, R, B, E, A, E, P, e, A, and then C. So B really just, all, this is all the same except B turned into C. And so now you have these two views and you can get all these, the powers of, you know, we talked about this. I definitely recommend watching the prelude video for it kind of, I think, dovetails nicely with this one because we kind of talked about when you have contravariant and covariant types, while we didn't really explain what those meant <laughs> in terms of variance, we did explain sort of the, the, the operations that tend to appear. When you have one of these types and you lose a lot of those if you have an invariant uh type so you can get back all these nice map contra map and and yeah it should just start clicking and if we let's see if we can find a nice one that has a bunch of uh these these types of things on it so yeah <laughs> map m has these uh upper and, and, and lower bounds but it's all just pretty mechanical um, yeah. and follows. It look it can look complicated when you have a lot of these type parameters, but if we if you understand it in, in just the single case, it's really just that same mechanism where, okay, RC, uh, we want to accept something. We, we're basically building a combinator here that's going to create some new type. But because RB is 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 contravariant, we need to have a subtype. We're going to allow the method we pass in to implicitly narrow the return value. Um, which is just nice for uh, API inference. It's it's going to we don't have to widen and narrow all of our types. This is it basically is just going to do the thing you want it to do. It looks kind of hectic, but if you just break it into these pieces and say, okay, if you want to widen or narrow implicitly based on the arguments, and return a new uh, wider or narrower type, you're going to get. If you just tried to use RB in here, if I just tried to use RB in here, we would get that you know contravariant in the covariant position. And then depending on whether it's contravariant or covariant, you either want to narrow or widen the type. Um, if it's covariant, you want to widen the type. But if you if you try to join a list of dog with a list of cat, you want it to widen it up to animal. So you want to take that A and do A1 as a super type, so it'll be animal. If it's contravariant, you want to do the opposite, where it, it, the, if, you, yeah, if you have a consumer of dogs and a consumer of cats, you would like to narrow it <laughs> to something else. Um, uh yeah but yeah it's pretty it's pretty mechanical here and and that's a great tip i actually haven't ever done that myself making these sex of functors i gotta try making <laughs> a sex of function it is uh it makes some really nice api things and you just do not realize as a user it's kind of crazy how little this leaks out to the user realm because it was you know a long time before i like command click onto a ref and was like wait that's a type what the hell is a z ref <laughs> yeah yeah well, cool. <laughs> awesome. We, I think we've, 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 yeah, that was awesome. Any, any other, any other sort of things that are important to mention? Um, I think maybe just one thing, if you want to go back to the, the Z ref thing for, for a second, I think another like intuition that's helpful with the R and the E is whenever you see that like RC is a subtype of RB um, in one of these method signatures, like the way I, I would think about that is, um, your original thing required some services and that, right, that's the RA and your new thing is going to require some other services, the RC. That's more, that is potentially more than the original services. So you write, might like originally require the clock and now you require the console as well. And so you're going to end up with something that requires both of those things, that requires the console and the clock. So like whenever you've got that subtype with like the environment, you're like adding additional services you require. And with the error type, if you've got your original thing that can like fail with like a password error and your new thing that can fail with a user error, 
you're getting back a new thing that can fail with both of those, with either of those types of errors. Um, so you're getting like the widest error, error type there. Um, so I think that's like a very like natural way to think about like the way those environment and error types typically compose. Yeah, I think, yeah, a good sort of, to, to sort of try to abstract over all that, it's about specificity, right? If you have one effect that needs console and you want to join that with another effect that needs, as you mentioned, clock, you want to get clock with console, right? And, and to think about types, clock with console is more specific. It's a subtype than both uh, console. It's a subtype of console as well as a subtype of clock, oops as well as a subtype of clock, right? It's, it's more specific than both of them, as dog is more specific than animal. And, and, say, and, and sometimes you wanna go the other way, whereas if you have one thing that can throw with domain error, like a SQL error, and another one that can throw with the API error, and you wanna join two effects together that each can fail with a different error type, you actually wanna get back something that's less specific. You want to widen it and get back like an app error that's a steel trait that both of these inherit from. So that's why you say, well, that E should be uh, wider than uh, the error, this, the specific SQL error versus this environment should be more specific. It should contain more information and it should be narrowed automatically. Um, so yeah, thinking about whether or not something is more or less specific and, and, and kind of yeah. How, how that should be resolved automatically by the compiler for you. It's, and it's really nice. It's like the compiler will create one of these intersecting types. It works really nicely with the environment. Um, yeah. In particular. And, yeah. And this is going to be even more natural with Scala 3, because in Scala 3, like when you do the console plus clock, you're essentially going to get back console and clock, if I didn't spell correctly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And if you combine the SQL error with the API error, you're going to get with these union types, you're going to get SQL error or API error. And so there's like actually, like if you want to kind of get into it, there's, there's a very beautiful symmetry here of like this is um, of union and intersection types between these two. But uh, I think that might be enough, uh, enough keeping up for now. Uh, oh, just one last comment. Clock with console is a tighter precondition than clock. Animal is a looser postcondition than exactly. cat. Yeah. Clock for Dijkstra. I might need to. <laughs> I might need you to uh, post some of those references in the. Um, yeah, it would, it would be great to tie this to. I mean, the the, the theory clearly my background is not quite in in the math or, or academia, but more in like this is really useful, <laughs> and uh, and I'm dumb and it makes sense to me. Um, and, and uh, yeah, but it would be great to, I've been poking around the math stuff, trying to reading some math books for dummies. Hopefully I can connect to that. But, uh, yeah, I feel yeah. like this is like, uh, we're definitely not saying anything that's like new here. It's been said like lots of times before by lots of very smart people in lots of like very specific ways. I think some of this is more just like, sometimes you need to hear it from different people or in different ways to kind of have it gel for you. So. Hopefully for someone this kind of helped things gel a little bit more, but uh, yeah, there's definitely a ton else out there on this. Yeah, it would be cool to have someone maybe with a, a mathy type theory background to give us the uh, the deep, the deep uh, yeah. tips, the, the galaxy <laughs> brain view of, of all this stuff. But um, I found that, yeah, sometimes, especially coming from Haskell, sometimes it can be a bit, it can be a little overwhelming to only get the, the advanced deep type <laughs> Type, uh, type theory view and, and sometimes just some practical, like it's very useful to do this because you don't have to implement all these traits uh, is a nice motivating, um, is a nice motivator. And then you can, you know, you realize it's useful, then you can uh, say, okay, maybe it's worth reading uh, some big textbooks on this. I'm curious, uh, but be driven by practical experience. Um, well, that was awesome. Uh, that, that, was, that was fun. I, I learned some stuff there myself. I want to, I want to make a sex of functor. It's not much to do. That. <laughs> well, thank you everyone. Uh, yeah. And obviously we, we, uh, we probably don't have time for it. Well, I don't yeah, know we, we, we didn't questions. have time for questions, but you also didn't have questions. So maybe take that, uh, for, uh, <laughs> next time of, um, I, you know, I don't know if people are just kind of nervous about doing it here. Like if you're, um, kind of just during the week, you have some thought and you want to share it with kid or I, like, uh, we definitely love to put together a, a good list of things that um, you're interested in learning more about, and we can uh, we can slot those in over the coming weeks. 
Yeah, I think just in terms of upcoming stuff, we have a lot of actual like hard coded things planned. Yeah, I think the next uh, two two or three weeks we actually have stuff coming up, but we will put it on the agenda. Yeah, I think next week we've got the uh, Quill release party for Scala three. So um, Alexander's done like a ton of like really impressive work on um, basically redoing Quill for Scala three because it very rely on macros and macros is probably one thing that like almost completely changed between Scala 2 and Scala 3. So um, I think that's going to be really cool. We're going to have a bunch of actually like special guests for that. And uh, I think it'll be it'll be a good, good time, an interesting time. Um, and then the week after that, we've got uh, Mike Rinaldi, who's the um, developer of kind of the Zio uh, version for TypeScript uh, coming in, who's been doing a lot of interesting work on Kind of what would a uh, Scala 3 native version of ZO be? Uh, that's probably at least a year away, just given that when you kind of develop natively for Scala 3, then you can't support Scala 2 anymore with that same source code or Scala 2.12, I should say. You can support Scala 2.13, but there are a lot of large organizations that are still on, still on Scala 2.12. Um, so we're kind of not able to really do a fully native Scala 3 version. Obviously, it'll work on Scala 3. It'll work totally fine. It's more as us as like library authors, we kind of can't use all the cool tools yet. Um, so he kind of played with like, what would that look like with the cool tools? So I think that'll be really interesting. And then the week after that, um, we've got Ash coming to talk to us about Zio Flow. Uh, and we're going to do a little bit of a session. I think like the one we did with John, where we'll get like a little bit of an overview of the library for her. And then we'll actually go through and we'll try to do a, a pull request with Kid and I pairing, and she'll kind of mentor us through as we, we do a, a first uh, pull request there. So, uh, and then after that, we've got a lot, after that, the world is wide open for uh, more front end stuff and more ideas from you. Um, but uh, yeah, lots of exciting stuff coming up. Yes, and I've encoded the dates here using the piano notation. That's a math reference. Uh, 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 for for dates so next 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 friday is totally free but it, uh but yes it, uh, i think we've mentioned this before that something that could be fun is if people are like using zio or, or anything else that you think we might be uh, able to help you with um it would be fun to sort of just do a bit of a a live i don't know we'll, we'll be your geek squad uh yeah and, and we could all like pair on your open source project or, or like a minimized example from like a, some production app where you're trying to use uh you know zio in your company um we could kind of show off some stuff and, and try to help you make that nice and shiny. Uh, so if, if anyone wants to volunteer for that, please reach out and that could be fun. But that was that was a blast, Adam and everyone. Thanks for joining uh, ah. until until next time. Oh, uh, oh, and oh, someone asked if we could be a, do an intro for something on like Zstream sometime. I think that would be great. Oh, yeah, I think that'd be a really good one. Yeah, I, I was I was thinking about that a little bit because we've like used it like a bunch of times in like some of the applications, but we haven't really done a like from the beginning. So that could be interesting. Yeah, and, and you've given me, Adam, I think in, in pairing on some stuff, some really good tips for making like, <laughs> it's such a powerful framework that it's not very constraining. Like you can write you can write things very verbosely that can also be expressed very minimally. And it's not always <laughs> obvious how to think fully in stream mode. So I think going over those things would be super beneficial. It's, it's yeah. very powerful. Awesome. Yeah, good, good suggestion. We'll definitely uh, I'll put that on the list. We'll get to Great. that eventually. Next, 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 next Friday. <laughs> but until then, take right. care, Bye, everyone. everyone.